just a, a little bit of familiarity here. What I actually do, if somebody asked me to describe my job, I would probably tell you that my job working for NASA is to make a better solar cell because that's what I've spent my entire career doing. Now, there are a lot of ways to make a solar cell better, and that's kind of been the fun of the whole thing because you get to explore different avenues and a lot of different things. Now, why solar cells? And furthermore, why on earth would you put a research group in solar cells in Cleveland, right? Kind of weird. There's no sun in Cleveland, as you probably are familiar with in the winter. Um, NASA Glenn Research Center, it used to be NASA Lewis Research Center, it was uh, renamed in the late 90s for John H. Glenn, our astronaut and center, senator, or now retired from Ohio. Um, it turns out that Glenn Research Center was one of the original three NASA centers when NASA was created in 1958. The other two were Langley Research Center in Virginia and Ames Research Center in California. These were old aeronautics centers. Glenn actually was founded in 1941, basically to do research on aircraft propulsion for World War II. After that, it continued on to do a lot of propulsion studies, and even to this day, there are still continuing efforts at Glenn in the areas of providing, uh, making engines more efficient, i.e., making your ticket prices go down for better use of fuel, actually finding alternative fuels for uh, aircraft, so those of you folks in the biology area, there's an opportunity for you there as well. They also do a lot of wind tunnel studies where you put models in a, in a wind tunnel and they look at the drag on the aircraft because if you can reduce the drag on an aircraft, you increase the efficiency of the flight and reduce the amount of fuel you would consume. So there's a lot of aeronautics research being done at Glenn Research Center. In addition to that, when NASA was formed in 58, they added the space power area that I'm a part of, and they also added space communications. Space communications actually won an Emmy from the motion picture industry because guess what? Without them, you wouldn't be seeing the Olympics live from Beijing, China. And so, the communication satellite really have changed the way we function in our world of today. Last but not least, there are some basic areas of study at the center. There are materials which you want for both aircraft and spacecraft. You want lighter, more, you want light, strong materials. When I go out to give a talk, um, inevitably, uh, you know, even if I go to fifth graders, <laughs> the first thing they'll ask me is, well, what do you make? <laughs> and, I, and I know that you may have many reasons for being here in college, but I'm sure one of them is so that you can have a reasonable job after you get out of school, whether you go on to graduate school and, and later into the workforce, or whether you go out and join the workforce after your undergraduate degree. I thought I would give you a little bit of an overview of what those salaries are like out there in the industry. Uh, so I started with academia. These are averages uh, across the nation for doctoral level colleges. This college is not that level. It's, it's a second division, and those are first division university scores. But then I went down and looked at the states. Well, why would anybody want to go into academics? Uh, obviously, you might like to teach, and <laughs> that might be a good thing to do if you're going into that position. Uh, 
And you want a reasonable salary. You want, and you want a steady, secure job. So some, those are some of the things that you will eventually start looking for as you make your way into the workforce. Uh, certainly, there are advantages to working nine months and getting to do th other things with your summer. Some professors augment their salaries by writing grants and doing research studies during the summer. Some just have vacations. <laughs> So there are there, as many faculty as exist here, there are probably that many different ways that people utilize their summers. But these are, if you look at them, quite good for a nine-month salary. What happens if you go into government? Well, you start low. <laughs> Government salaries, while they don't start off being anything too stellar, they do tend to grow fairly rapidly. Uh, and you, again, you have a very stable, secure occupation. Uh, there hasn't been a reduction in forces, what we call getting fired these days in the government. There hasn't been one of those since the early 1970s at NASA. So there really is very little probability that there will be another one in the near future. Okay, so you've got some money. There are, I, I thought I'd stop a little bit and point out the good and bad uh, of working for the government. And obviously, I have found it a lot more good to it than bad. I do think, I, when I, when I uh, was doing job interviews, when I decided to join the workforce after being home with my kids for a while, um, I applied a variety of places. NASA was the lowest salary that I was offered at the time, but it had the most interesting job. And furthermore, I discovered, but really only kind of learned about it after the fact, there is a lot to be said for having a family and coordinating that with a government job. First, I get over five weeks of vacation a year. Second, I have flexible hours for when I come into my job, and I used to adjust that depending on, the, on my children's school schedule, right? Anytime between 6 a.m. and 9.30, and you leave eight and a half hours later. Eight and a half because you have a half an hour for lunch built into the program. Also, and this is another thing that I really truly took advantage of, suppose you want to go to your child's school play in the middle of the day. Well, what you do is you add work to one day and use those hours to take it off another day. And that's what compensatory time and credit hours allow you to do that. So that flexibility in handling your family affairs is really very convenient. The Family Leave Act, when you have a child, you have 10 weeks that you can take off. And that, that is also true for you and your spouse if they both work for the government. The other I, thing that I think is important, because I once did a, a little homemade survey of the women that were at NASA, the ones that had PhDs. I was curious when they got their PhDs. When I looked into it, I found that about half of them got their degrees after they had come to work for NASA. There are very good educational benefits in working for the government. They support your continuing education. So they will actually pay you your regular salary for you to go to school. They'll pay everything but buy your books. It's the only thing they won't do. <laughs> so, you can do that, you can come in with a bachelor's degree, and many of the women had done that and had gotten their PhD. You have a choice of many areas to work in. It's not like you're hired by one individual and you're going to be stuck in that job for life. A lot of things change. For example, the boss might change. <laughs> you might go from a very good boss to a very bad boss.
colleagues, some of whom are material scientists, some are chemists, some are engin electrical engineers, some are material scientists, and some are even mechanical engineers, not just physicists. Okay? We work as a team. It's very hard to get a diversity of viewpoints you know, if you don't have any diversity in your workforce. And whether that is a minority or whether that is a woman in the scientists. We are minorities in science and are labeled as such actually by the government. So one of the reasons I'm here today is to kind of try to persuade you that, you know, if you are headed in the direction of a science, engineering, or math degree, that I, you know, that I hope you continue and I hope you do well. The other thing that's happening, and the government itself is very concerned about this, is that we were getting, you know, the problem is you guys don't want to go to grad school. You've been in school a long time, right? You think, I've been a student a long time. I'm really anxious to get out there and be in that workforce. I don't necessarily want to go another four or five years to graduate school. But if I could encourage you with that, I would say that it is really a lot easier to continue on in grad school right after your undergraduate career. Why is that? Well, several reasons. First of all, you've been a poor student for four years. You're poor. You're used to being poor. Go ahead and go to grad school and get it over with. If you go out and get a job, you're going to be used to having money. You won't want to give that up to go back to grad school. <laughs> the, the other thing that happens is you'd like to get on with your lives. Okay, you're in your 20s. You think, gee, I'd like to get married. I'd like to have a family. And, and it, does, it is true that if you go to grad school, typically women do postpone for a little bit beginning a family. And that, that is a truism, and the reason for that is quite simple. It's, you know, diverting energy and time. It's not easy to do that. Um, as a result, colleges that grant uh, graduate degrees have become to rely upon foreign student populations because they need the students to have to do the research programs that they are used to doing as faculty members, and the government then steps in and says, well, <clears throat> I've got this project that I need doing, but I have to have a U.S. citizen do it. Well, where are you guys? You're not there. You're not there in graduate school. Okay, so let me encourage you, even though you're maybe a freshman or sophomore undergraduate, to start thinking about the possibility of a graduate degree. You're like gold, trust me. You're like gold in graduate school because they will pay your way to go to school in the sciences and engineering and mathematics. You won't have to put up a dime. In fact, some schools will even, or some jobs after graduate education, particularly in the government, will actually repay your student loans as part of the enticement to get you to come and work for them. So, don't worry so much about the money is the bottom line of all this. Well, how many jobs are out there? There's actually quite a few jobs. This was May statistics, uh, which is really the last point we could get them for. The May 2008 haven't been published. Um, there's a lot of jobs, and this is a, this is a change over the last decade. There are a lot of jobs in computer and mathematical science, and they have the highest mean average salary. There are a fair number of jobs, two and a half million, in engineering occupations with a pretty good mean salary. And last but certainly not least in any respect, there are one and a quarter million jobs for life, physical, and social science occupations with a mean average salary of 62K, roughly. Um, if you look at foreign-born individuals in the workforce, 
Uh, there were 20% of the total holding a bachelor's degree, 34% of the total holding a master's degree, and 41% of the total holding a doctorate degree. So our U.S. citizens are not doing their fair share of living up to getting a graduate degree. And these percentages have all increased significantly since 1990. So now, if the government wants to go out and, and find a graduate student, and they support a fair number of graduate students, they're hard pressed to even find one in the graduate schools. So there are jobs out there. Furthermore, if you look at the pro projections, I'm not big on crystal balls, folks, but if you look at the projection for the future employment of scientists and engineers and, and uh, mathematicians, you find that it is one of the best areas in terms of projected employment than anywhere else in the industry. The only thing that's better, oddly enough, <laughs> perhaps not so oddly, is the healthcare industries. Those are very high as well. Well, where would you be likely to work if you come out? Now, there are a number of programs out there, and these are very important to you as students because how do you know where you want to go? Well, ideally, what you'd really like to do is kind of sample these jobs. Right? Let's take a summer, let's spend a summer working someplace. Let's find out if I like it or not. So you can do that. There are a number of NASA programs that will bring you to a center. The closest one to you, of course, is Glenn Research Center. And we have a little bit of everything there, so you can probably encompass all of your science and engineering degrees there. But there are other centers that specialize in other things. Now, you got to think of this early. You can't wait to May and say, oh my God, what am I going to do in my summer? All right? You're going to have to apply in December. Guess what? Go to this website in December. These applications are due in January. And you want to be able to contact your teachers before they go on the Christmas holidays for references. Okay, so think ahead. Think about your summer. Think about spending it. You get to choose the field. If you go to these applications, you'll see you're asked to choose physics, chemistry, engineering, uh, aeronautical engineering, mechanical engineering, civil engineering, et cetera, et cetera. You get to pick the field, put in your application, and come. If you're seriously, really seriously want to work for NASA, get in a school's co-op program. Many schools have a co-op program with NASA. Generally, these take a year longer. So, for example, if you were going to be in engineering and you're getting an engineering degree in four years, it would, might take you five years because you're going to spend a couple of semesters out in a variety of jobs. Now, at NASA, the advantage to that is, and this is often true for the companies that you work for as well, is that they will make every effort to hire the co-ops first. When there's a job opening, it's going to go to those co-ops before it goes anywhere else. So it's a one surefire way <laughs> to get a job offer from NASA. NASA is not the only government agency that does things like that. National Science Foundation does, DOE does, the Army does. There's a whole lot of government agencies that have similar student-based programs. Get out there and look for them, but do not wait till the spring to do it, <laughs> okay? Most of them will be due in January. Also, you may find your faculty advisors or whatever they have for guidance counselors here at school to help you with some of these programs. So what I would encourage you to do if you look at what you 
enjoy doing is that first of all, you know, you've been in school a long time, yeah, okay. You've been in, you know, you've been there, what, 12 years of uh, high school, another four, so you've been in school 16 years. Give it a thought. If you graduate from college and go to work at age 22, the chances are good you're going to be on the job for at least 40 years. Please, folks, make it a job that you'll enjoy. Choose, have the most options, most opportunities available to you. You do have to work at it. It won't just come to you. You will have to work at it. You will have to put in applications to do some of these things above and beyond the call of being a student at the college. So by all means, use your imaginations, work a little harder, and have a good life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>